Hello Vinyl Community and uh, welcome to another video about uh, the music and the albums and LPs I've been listening in the last days, maybe weeks. And um, as usual, before I put uh, the records back on the shelf, I can show you some of them and maybe you see something that you find interesting or maybe you are just appalled by uh, my rather idiosyncratic and uh, non-conformist taste. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry that I so often fail to commit uh, to rather more conventional music. Mm. And yet I still feel that there might come a time in my life when I finally start to uh, kind of dig into uh, the more classic uh, rock music uh, environment, uh, but um, I always seem to miss. Now, uh, let me put on my reading glasses. I'm gonna tell you, if this was the only symptom of aging that I feel right now, it would be a blessing. So, uh, but uh, that way I can easier read what's written on these CDs and albums. <laughs> Because um, otherwise I'm kind of uh, condemned to make this gesture here all the time. Which uh, I'm not the only person on VC doing that. But uh, it's not necessary. I have rather new reading glasses. I think we bought them like last month or something. So um, anyway. Um, first I have this CD here. Which is called Music from the Arabian Nights. Could it be more cliched? Could it be more twee? Um... By the way, twee is a new word I've learned in English. I'm still learning English words, at, at least as far as my aging brain is still able to memorize anything. Um, I learned twee from Jeff Calico Silver because he used it in one of his videos and I had to look the word up and I thought, oh, this is a cute word, twee. Well, this CD kind of feels twee, at least the way it is uh, designed. Um, Kind of, I like this kind of a airmail uh, thingy here. I'm a, I'm a sucker for stuff like that. The idea of a musical postcard coming to your home from a distant, exotic place. But um, it's so funny because sometimes, sometimes you you can be standing in a supermarket and there is this huge box right behind the cashier. Um, so you come buy it while standing in the line and it's full of these cheap CDs and usually it just screams at you don't touch me don't touch me I'm cheap and awful but if you are bored you just start to look at it and of course I could not say no because this cost only like four euro or something so, so I bought it brought it home and then threw it into a box and forgot about it for at least 10 or 12 years so this <laughs> this took a while until it started to <laughs> offer any dividend but after 10 years pass by you open some box while cleaning up, cleaning up and realize that it's full of CDs and that you've never looked at that you've never listened to you that you even have unpacked so uh, a case of bad conscience uh, comes across and you start to listen to them in this case this is quite wonderful so uh, if you think this is just some kind of a cheesy um, oriental music it is not and so I started to investigate why is this music so good and uh, just uh, to find out that this is a kind of a re-release um, from um, well kind of like mid 90s and but a few years prior to that this had already been released as a kind of a standalone album by three uh, three uh, musicians called Kutsi Erguner, Mahmoud Tabrizi Zade and Bruno Kaya playing uh, respectively the ney, the Camanche fiddle and the tabla drums. So you have a kind of a cool, uh, tight, um, kind of North African, Middle Eastern three-piece with a lot of uh, improvisation and it's a cool album. And um, it's, something, it's something you would usually expect to be released on the ECM label and certainly not something you expect to find in a kind of a cheap item box in a supermarket but um, I'm glad I have it so uh, sometimes you find nice jams this way um, let's stay in the similar kind of cultural environment because I've been listening to the soundtrack for the movie L'Atlantide 
by Richard Horowitz. And uh, this is a movie from the 90s and obviously a movie taking place in North Africa. So uh, probably no one better to write the soundtrack for it than Richard Horowitz, um, who is kind of a master of the of the sort of uh, North African Tuareg pastiche. Um, to the extent that uh, it's almost fascinating to imagine that he uh, writes those tracks somewhere in the middle of New York um, and that those pieces of music are not recorded in some tent in southern Algeria. Of course, but when I came across Richard Horowitz for the first time, it was for the it was in the soundtrack uh, to the movie The Sheltering Sky um, by Ryuichi Sakamoto. So this is a wonderful movie uh, by uh, Bernardo Bertolucci with Deborah Winger and uh, John Malkovich. And Sakamoto wrote probably one of the greatest movie soundtracks of all times here. I mean, this entire sheltering sky suite is an orchestral piece and it's beautiful, very expressionistic and very kind of experimental in parts and uh, wonderful. But to kind of spice up the atmosphere of the overall soundtrack, there are three tracks by Richard Horowitz. When I heard them for the first time, I thought... It was like 1991 probably when I bought this album. I thought like, wow, this must be something recorded somewhere in the heart of the Sahara. And uh, I even couldn't believe that some guy is just recording that um, at his home studio, probably uh, somewhere in Brooklyn or something. So, um, of course, um, in later years, I was always looking for more of these uh, kind of very authentic pastiche type of tracks by Richard Horowitz. And... Uh, so on every CD, on every album, you find few of them, and, but um, again, uh, this album was a pretty good choice for this type of craving, because uh, while the soundtrack overall is kind of a mixture between sort of a synthesizer electronic soundtrack and a little kind of orchestral soundtrack, uh, there are there's a whole bunch of like two, three minute long themes that are kind of very authentically rooted in uh, the traditional North African music quite wonderful. It's not the type of CD you want to listen from beginning to the end. Um, it's too eclectic for that probably. But um, as, a, as a source for um, all kind of uh, thematic uh, playlists, it's quite wonderful. So Richard Horowitz, L'Atlantide. So uh, let's get to some albums. Um, first of all, just to stay one more time in a rather um, kind of North African Middle Eastern vibe. Uh, this is a album by Rabi Abu Khalil um, called Nafas. Um, by the way, one probably one of my favorite album covers. Uh, it's quite wonderful. This is the you can see uh, the Djoser pyramid in Egypt uh, in the background and kind of love these sort of twilight uh, dark. Uh, skies above it. So uh, this is uh, recorded with Selim Kusur, Glenn Wallace and Setrak Sarkisian. Uh, so it's basically kind of four, four piece uh, with uh, with um, Selim Kusur playing the Nai, Glenn Wallace playing uh, the big frame drum and uh, Setrak Sarkisian playing the Darbuka. And of course Rabbi Abu Khalil playing the lute or the Oud to be more precise. So it's an interesting four piece with uh, two guys on percussive instruments and the other two guys uh, basically playing uh, uh, a flute and a Ar Arabic lute. So this came out on ECM in the late 80s, 1988. Um, and um, yeah, it's quite a wonderful, almost entirely instrumental album um, that uh, kind of takes you on a journey. And if you are a fan of Rabbi Abu Khalil's music, then uh, this is certainly an album that will not disappoint you. Uh, so uh, it has this quite a wonderful, wonderful atmospheric sound uh, that will take you to places and um, can, for example, uh, be a nice uh, companion uh, while doing some work, probably in the, in the home office, as it's called today, in the age of... Uh, the pandemic so um, really a nice record and by the way a great great copy got a bit lucky with this one it's really clean and sounds when I when I bought it it's really sounded like new 
anyway um <clears throat> now uh at this one this one is a bit is a touch of kind of snobbery to be honest because i've had this record for years on cd uh the curse of the pheromones by startled insects and uh, i saw it just uh for not that much money on uh, um uh, on on vinyl so um i could not say no i had to buy it so um this is kind of the original album as it came out um kind of funny because it has this it has this um inlay and it's actually kind of a, it's a kind of a type of a 3d effect that it has or is supposed to have you just have to play around with it a little bit um anyway now uh, this is one of my favorite albums actually because this is outstanding i mean um this band is a complete mystery to me because i've never heard anything about them not even back in the day not now it's I don't know who they are, but they just released this one record in the kind of mid late eighties on a, uh, on, a, on a label called Antilles. And um, wow, it's kind of a, the sound is like imagine imagine a strange mixture of the of the band Japan um, that can dance and uh, maybe a touch of kind of Ryuichi Sakamoto soundtrack music. Throw this into a blender and you get this kind of outstanding, uh, slightly jazzy, slightly kind of darkish, brooding album. It's entirely instrumental. And it's very fascinating. I mean, I keep coming back to this record and it never disappoints. It's very fascinating and it's, uh, it's quite eclectic, probably. That's the right word because uh, it's certainly not following an exact... A stylistic path um, but it's highly fascinating highly great musicianship and um, it's a complete mystery to me this record but uh, sounds wonderful great album great instrumental record um, and uh, certainly one of the best albums I know from the 80s so let's go back in time um, to a another um, another album that uh, that is part of a certain certain journey of mine um, this is the album Tempest by the band Tempest uh, this must have been like 1971 I think uh, 72 73 yeah this was recorded at 72 and, re uh, and released in 73 but this is a kind of contemporary release came out on a label called long hair I think like I bought one or two records by them I will show you the other one later um, so um, this is a band uh, started by John Heisman basically immediately after after Colosseum uh, ceased to exist and uh, he got together with uh, Mark Clark on bass and Paul Williams on vocals and uh, Alan Holdsworth on guitar and it's quite outstanding. First of all, if you ever wanted to hear how Alan Holdsworth sounds uh, before he kind of uh, dedicated himself completely over to his uh, uh, very sort of uh, esoteric uh, legato fast finger style, um, that's probably the, re the one record that you want to give a listen to because uh, this is one of the few occasions when you can hear kind of uh, Alan Holdsworth um, uh, using the wah-wah pedal and doing all those uh, fancy rock hero stuff that he later kind of uh, <laughs> didn't want to do anymore. But uh, this is kind of one of his early works and um, certainly a um, for me for me an, another important album to close uh, my my long project of uh, getting together all the albums that uh, Alan Holdsworth appeared on and I'm pretty far ahead actually with that I mean there's just there's still a substantial list of records I need to <laughs> buy over the years but um, let's say uh, it's kind of less than 10% I think um, so um, this album also answers the question uh, how Paul Williams and Alan Holdsworth met because Paul Williams became the lead singer on uh, at least the first two or three of Alan Holdsworth's solo albums in the kind of late 70s, early 80s. 
So this is how they met. Um, so yeah, this is a great, wonderful, uh, progressive rock uh, slash fusion slash psychedelic rock album. Yeah, so this music is good fun. It came, it was re-released in this slightly more eccentric uh, layout. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that uh, I have another stepping stone uh, within my Alan Holdsworth collection journey. And uh, let's continue. Uh, yeah, um, you know what, let's stay with this label I was talking about. Because they started to re-release uh, all the albums by uh, Secret Oyster. Secret Oyster is a progressive rock band from Denmark uh, that was active in the 70s. Um, incorporating a lot of jazz and jazz fusion, a lot of kind of theatrical uh, music in their sound. And uh, they were kind of the go-to band, for example, to accompany uh, kind of avant-gardistic modern uh, ballet ensembles and stuff like that. So they enjoyed doing this. Um, and uh, this label, Long Hair, um, started to re-release all of their records. So uh, I immediately have, had to get this one here straight to the Kranken House. Um, this uh, came out originally in um, 1976. Um, and I think basically this was like their last album for quite a while. This is a great album by a wonderful band uh, that uh, I have now known for a while, but um, I certainly always wanted to have all of their records and um, still two more to go. Um, yeah, so if you like if you like 70s progressive rock uh, with a strong kind of jazz fusion feel to it and slightly psychedelic and um, a lot of emphasis on uh, saxophone, uh, so the entire band is kind of a surrounded around a sax player called uh, Karsten Vogel and um, yeah this is a great music I mean mostly it's basically instrumental um, and um, cool sound and a uh, great example of sort of a 70s uh, European prog rock um, yeah and uh, to stay with the same band and the same label uh, this is sort of kind of their last album or kind of like an like an epilogue epilogue release called uh, Striptease. Now this came out two years ago, I think 2019. Again, re-released by Long Hair, but uh, it's more like an afterthought because this music was recorded in the same year that as uh, Straight to the Kranken House in 1976. Uh, when this band was uh, hired to write a uh, ballet music for a kind of modern avant-gardistic ballet. So they created this uh, sound here. and uh, But uh, this whole project kind of fell apart and the music was never released. Now the original tapes for this album are basically lost. Because there are nice liner notes inside of the record and... Uh, so you kind of uh, um, can uh, figure out why the record sounds the way it sounds. But um, Karsten Vogel at least had a kind of a tape backup of this entire recording session. Um, not just a, not a cheap cassette or something. It must have been some kind of a real tape, but uh, not, I mean, not in an optimal quality. So um, it's kind of a musical archaeology. Um, it's, it's, as far as uh, kind of audio sound goes, it's a bit below par, so to speak. Um, you have to take this into account. Uh, it's like if you are a big fan of this band, then you will just want to have this record kind of uh, for completion of your collection. And uh, but I mean, you, you, there is a certain you can if you hear closely, you can hear a certain type of a tape tape hiss in the background and uh, it's not optimal it's not it's not a disaster um, but uh, again I, I keep calling this musical archaeology you have to take certain stuff into account because uh, it's I mean the alternative would have been never to release it and uh, just uh, allow this music to get lost uh, in history and time 
but um so here it is um so it's 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 a good it's a good record um it's certainly uh i like uh, their other albums certainly better but uh, there are some quite enjoyable moments here and uh, it's kind of a nice album um so actually i, I really like this type of records actually because uh, it's kind of cool to have uh, something in your hand that kind of wasn't meant to be and uh where just uh, the just the the process between existence and non-existence is kind of really thin and uh am i just rambling right now but uh, maybe you understand what i'm trying to say um um it was not supposed to be and uh, through uh, uh, a causality of uh, lucky events in the end you still get a you can get an album and can listen to it and uh, for me this is always like like a little miracle that those things happen so um i'm always happy camper if i can find some exotic exotic album like that and uh, i can live with the with these little flaws uh, in the recording uh, just because it's in some way it's kind of unfinished or or the the or the, the the sound quality is not optimal etc etc <laughs> hmm. so uh what else do we have here yeah let's stay let's stay in a bit of a vibrant um, musical environment samurai samba by the yellow jackets uh, yeah i like i like the yellow jackets it's kind of an interesting example of a of a band that has probably kind of a jazz fusion roots as far as uh, the musician sh musicianship goes and the quality of the music but uh, it's a very light-hearted music more kind of an 80s jazz funk uh, with a certain kind of a pop aesthetic to it. Um, so this is certainly a kind of a jazzy music. Uh, it's very funky and very poppy and kind of a good mood music. And But at the same time you can uh, at any given moment you just hear that there is a lot of uh, kind of a heavyweight musicianship behind it. So these guys are choosing to sound light-hearted and... Uh, Kind of uh, almost trivial, but uh, always with a big sense of style and musical abilities. I'm not always listening to dark, brooding uh, Middle Eastern music or something like that. <laughs> so uh, I keep coming back to this band here, um, which is kind of a little similar to Yellow Jackets, um, which is Caldera. Uh, this is uh, this is their album Sky Islands uh, from uh, 1977, I think. Huh? Let me have a look. Yes, yeah, 77 came out on Capitol Records. So these guys are really killing it. I mean, this is an amazing uh, musicianship going on here. But at the same time, while while I would call this straight out a jazz fusion album, kind of like probably in the same in the same spirit uh, as uh, the german band passport maybe so there is again a kind of uh, lightheartedness to this music so this is not the type of uh, heady cerebral jazz fusion of uh, weather report or return to forever or mahavishnu orchestra uh, it's quite obvious that these guys are kind of looking for having fun with the uh, jazz music in general with latin music and um, but at the same time the musicians behind it the musicians behind it are outstanding and these guys are really great some really amazing flute playing and uh, the guitar solos are really crazy here so um i keep coming back to this album because uh, it's quite wonderful at the same time it has this really nice uh, funky vibe to it and um exactly the same goes uh, to their follow-up record called Time and Chance. Uh, so uh, kind of following the same trend. Um, yeah, quite wonderful music. I mean, you can get these records by Caldera really for a few bucks uh, in a very good quality. But, and if you like kind of good, uh, sophisticated uh, jazz fusion, jazz funk music uh, that uh, gives no one headaches, um, this is certainly the right address. Uh, I think this is a band from, I guess they're from New York, I think, uh, but um, you can always say that about a jazz fusion band from America. 
which uh, can be uh, well actually I think they're from Los Angeles actually so uh, yeah Caldera and the final record I want to show you um, <coughs> excuse me is um, something much more well it's probably wrong to call it contemporary because this too is almost 20 years ago where has the time gone but this is uh, the double album this world by the band Rima and uh, this came out on compost records which is kind of the uh, the um, house records of the German band Jesanova and this is exactly uh, in that vibe uh, so um, this is kind of the this came out 2003 so uh, this is uh, kind of the time of the marriage between uh, deep house and kind of future jazz or sometimes it's called new jazz and uh, this album is quite precisely on the cusp of that so if you like Jesanova this is certainly for you um, so it has a kind of wonderful jazzy vibe while at the same time um, of course uh, borrowing a lot from the world of, uh, of techno and disco and house and uh, trip up and uh, acid jazz and uh, whatever you want um, so yeah kind of wonderful kind of a sophisticated dance music uh, that uh, was quite typical in those years and uh, was kind of never meant to be danced to so uh, this is kind of the moment when uh, so this deep house and down tempo music has shifted more towards a uh, kind of a lounge music and listening music and the music that you would listen at home and not only associate with dancing in a club yeah and um, this is a uh, quite a good one and uh, a lot of kind of a summer feeling behind it honestly uh, but uh, I was just listening to it today in the morning so that was it and uh, hope you thought there is something interesting here and uh, if not it's the best I could do see you bye bye